We want to welcome everyone to the Roy City Church of Christ. It's good to have our visitors. We have several visitors with us. We encourage you to ask us any questions. If you have any questions about our faith and our practice here concerning what we do, what we teach, what we do not do, and we will strive to go to the Bible, the Word of God, and give you an answer. Hope that you will stay after our worship service when we'll have further Bible study in our Bible classes. We have classes for all ages. And also stay after that. We're going to have a meal together. We have plenty of food. Don't be concerned if you didn't bring anything. We always have food left over. So we hope that you will stay and eat with us so that we can get to know you a little bit better. We want to talk about good news this morning. Good news. That's something always that is appealing. Oftentimes, when we go about our life and we read the newspaper, if we watch the news, most of what we hear is bad. We hear a lot of bad news and it's discouraging. But we want to talk about good news this morning. The good news about salvation. John chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 16 and 17 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. That's the good news that we're going to talk about this morning. The good news that there is a God, that God did create this world, and that God not only created this world, but that He loves us so much that He sent His Son to save us. That He loved us so much that He sent His Son not to condemn us, but that we might be saved through Him. That's good news. That's something that we should be looking forward to in our study. But to understand and appreciate the good news we have to understand the bad news. You've heard the expression, I've got good news and I've got bad news. Well, we're going to start with talking about the bad news first. We can't fully appreciate the good news until we understand the bad news. And the bad news is this. It was necessary for a Savior to come into the world to save us because of sin. We have sinned. It started in Genesis chapter 3, but the warning is given in Genesis chapter 2. Remember Genesis chapter 1, God created the world in six days, and on the seventh day He stopped, and then He blessed Adam and Eve, put them in a garden, gave them a paradise on earth. Heaven was on earth. Complete perfection. Everything was very good. There was a law there. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. He warns Adam and Eve concerning the tree that is known as the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You may eat of all the trees, but there is one there that you're not to eat of. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The day that you eat of it, you will surely die. In Genesis chapter 3, we see Satan comes on the scene. He tempts Eve. Eve gives in. Adam gives in. They sin by eating of that tree. And on that day, they die. Not physically. We're told later on that Adam lived to be 930 years old. He died and she died spiritually that day, separated from God. And as a result of that, they were removed from the garden and separated from the tree of life. Therefore, they began to physically die. They died that day. They were separated from God. They were innocent until proven guilty by their own actions, by their own sin. You see, we fall into that when we sin. You see, we are sinners because we sin. We are not sinners because we're born sinful. The religious world will tell you that we're born in sin. 
The Bible doesn't teach that. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20 says this, The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Individual responsibility. That's what we find in Ezekiel chapter 18. And so we have, verse 20 tells us, the soul, the individual, the person who sins shall die. We know he's talking about spiritual death there because everyone dies physically. Even innocent babies tragically die physically. But he's referring to spiritual death, the same type of spiritual death that Adam and Eve experienced when they disobeyed God. And as a result of that, we are individually responsible. Guilt is not transferred from our parents to our children, from our ancestors to us, and from Adam to anyone else. We are individually responsible for our own actions. And that bad news is that that sin causes us to be separated from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 explains what this death is. Death means a separation. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. God is saying through the prophet Isaiah, I'm not unable to save you. However, your iniquities, uh, iniquities have caused a separation and your sins have hidden my face from you because God is absolutely perfect. Because he is absolutely perfect, he cannot dwell with imperfection. Imperfection and perfection cannot dwell together. And therefore, our sins cause us to be separated from God. And that is the spiritual death that we all undergo when we, by our own action, when we are tempted, we give in and we sin. Ephesians 2 and verse 1 in the New Testament. Paul talks to the brethren in Ephesus, and he says before that they were before their conversion, he said that that you were made alive when they were converted, who were dead in trespasses and sins. They were the walking dead. Biologically alive, but spiritually dead. And that is the condition of every person who is in a lost condition. They are dead spiritually. But God is able to make us alive. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 goes back to that original couple. Goes back to Adam. It says, therefore, just as one man, sin entered the world in death through sin. Thus death spread to all men because all sinned. One man, sin entered the world. That's talking about Adam. Through Adam and Eve's transgression, sin entered the world and death through sin, separation from God, and thus death spread to all. Keep in mind, this death is spiritual. Because all have sinned. And when a person sins, they lose their innocence. Just as Adam and Eve lost their innocence when they sinned. This separation will lead to a terrible place. It will lead to a place of horror because the wages of sin is death. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. The payment for sin is death. And Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8 says, this death, if we die in a spiritual condition like this, is the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. It's described as hell. Eternal punishment. And there is no rescuing from this. Once a person goes there, a person cannot be resurrected from the second death. There is no hope then. There's only hope in this life. And the hope that we have is because of Jesus Christ. That is the good news. That brings us back to the good news. We understand Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've all said, done, thought things that are contrary to the will of God and therefore the wages of sin is death. 
But Romans 6 and verse 23, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the latter part of Romans 6 and verse 23. That's the good news. The wages of sin leads to spiritual separation, leads to hell. But the gift of God, that's eternal life. That's only in Jesus Christ our Lord. That's why Paul said in Ephesians 2 and verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. In other words, what Paul is saying in Ephesians 2 and verse 8 is, we cannot save ourselves without a Savior. There's no way we can say, okay, I understand, preacher, I've been a bad person, I'm just going to be so good that I'll deserve to go to heaven. I'll score enough points that I'll just get to be in heaven because my good works will outweigh my bad works. It doesn't work that way. We need a Savior. We need one to come to rescue us or to reconcile us back to God. Romans chapter 5 has a lot to say about that. Romans chapter 5 beginning <coughs> excuse me, in verse 6. For when we were still without strength, that's our spiritually dead condition, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man would one die, yet perhaps for a good man some would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, spiritually dead, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. See, we're justified by the blood of Jesus. He had to die on the cross and shed his blood for justification to take place. That word justified means to be acquitted. It means to be made not guilty even though we are guilty. And it's only through the blood of Jesus Christ that that is possible. He goes on to say, Romans chapter 5, verses 10 through 11, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. We're reconciled to God. Think of the word reconciled with the word reconnected. We were disconnected from God when we sinned. The only one that can reconnect us back to God is His Son, Jesus Christ. That's the only way we can be reconnected. The word reconciled means to be brought back into fellowship with God. And see, we broke fellowship with God when we sinned, just as Adam and Eve did. They died when they sinned. And we, through His Son, Jesus Christ, because of his shed blood that justifies, can be reconnected to God through the death of his son. We have now received the reconciliation. This is the gospel. This is the good news. But the one who died to bring us back together had to be someone unique. It could not have been just any ordinary human being. And it could not be just God himself. It took the sacrifice of someone who had both natures. The nature of God, the nature of man. It took someone who shared both natures, holy God and holy man, to bridge that gap. And that sacrifice had to be the Son of God because He was God and man. He's in a category all by Himself. That's why He's called the only begotten Son of God. Only begotten comes from a Greek word which means unique, one of a kind. And so Christ dying on the cross as the one who is God, the Son of God, and man, the Son of Man, before He came to earth, John 1 and verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. Christ was in the beginning with God 
And Christ was God. He goes on to say, John does in John chapter 1 verse 14, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Word that was God, the revelation of God, Jesus Christ is the Word of the very revelation of God, not only by His teaching, but by His life. And so when He came to earth, His very life is an example to us. His very life that He lived is a revelation to us. That Word became flesh, that He might dwell among us. And He had to be flesh so He could die on the cross. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 6 says that Christ existed in the form of God and did not re regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. He existed in the form of God. He was with God. He was with the Father. He was with the Holy Spirit. And He was God. He shared the very nature of the Father and the Holy Spirit. But He considered that something that was uh, something that he regarded it, equality with God a thing not to be grasped or held on to. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7, But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He was God, and without ceasing to be God, he emptied himself. We know he was God while he was on earth. Because in John 8 and verse 58, he said, Before Abraham was, I am showing his eternal existence. Why did he take on human form? Why did he do that? Because of Philippians 2 and verse 8. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. You see, God can't die. God is spirit, John 4 and verse 24. He cannot be killed. And no ordinary man could do what God can do. So it took someone that shared both natures, both God and man. And that was Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, Peter tells us, that he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. My sins, your sins were born on the cross, born on the tree. He took the full burden of my sin and your sin and the full burden of the sins of all the human race on the tree. That's why the prophecy says in Isaiah 53 and verse 6, some 700 years before he was born, it says the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He became the sin bearer on the cross, the sacrifice of the God man. But that's not the end of the story. He conquered death by his resurrection. On the third day, he rose again. He told his apostles numerous times I'm going to Jerusalem. They're going to mistreat me. They're going to put me to death. But on the third day, I'm going to rise again. And sure enough, he did. And by that resurrection from the dead, when they went to the tomb and found it empty, it proved that Jesus was the Son of God. Romans chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, Paul, writing to the brethren at Rome, says he is writing concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. He was of the seed of David. He's a descendant of King David according to the flesh. That's a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. And he was declared to be the Son of God. That's his divinity. By the resurrection from the dead. That's a historical event. That actually happened. And it proved by any shadow of a doubt that he is who he claimed to be. That's the very good news that we're preaching this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Paul, writing to the brethren at Corinth, says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, that word gospel means good news, 
which I preach to you, which also you receive, and which you also stand by, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the gospel. That is the good news. But how does one receive this salvation? We know that God has made this available. We know that God, in His grace and mercy, sent His Son. We know that there is salvation made available by the death, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We know that is for us. But how do we receive that salvation? How does it affect a person today in 2007? Well, Beware of false answers, because there are plenty of them out there. Beware of the false answer that says everyone is going to heaven. That's universalism. Everybody's going to go to heaven eventually. Beware of that. Beware of the false answer that faith alone will save you. That's being taught here in Roy City. It's not being taught here. That's being taught here in Roy City. That all you have to do is believe and you'll be saved. The Bible makes that very clear, but that's not true. James chapter 2 makes it very clear that faith without works is dead. No one's going to go to heaven on a dead faith. And beware of the answer that says, just say the sinner's prayer and you will be saved. Again, that's being taught in Royal City, but not here. Because it's nowhere found in the Bible. I've had several denominational preachers admit to me the sinner's prayer is not in the Bible. They'll tell you it's not there. When you press them, when you ask them to show it to you, so there are false answers given to the question, what must I do to be saved? How does a person receive this salvation? you got to be born again. You must be born again if you want to be saved, if you want to be in the kingdom of God. In John chapter 3, Jesus is talking to a religious leader by the name of Nicodemus, a religious man, and he tells him that most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He goes on further to explain himself in verse 5. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You've got to be born again to see the kingdom of God. And to be born again, you must be born of water and the Spirit to enter the kingdom of God. So what does a person have to do? Well, they have to be born again. That's not the physical birth. That's a new birth. That is a rebirth. A person has to be converted, Jesus is saying, if they wish to see the kingdom of heaven. And they're converted or born again when they're born of water and the Spirit. So one might say, well, I understand the Father's part, God the Father's part in the plan of salvation. He sent the Son. And I understand the Son's part in the plan of salvation. He's the one who died. He died on the cross. He shed His blood, and through His blood we can be reconciled. We can be justified. I understand the Holy Spirit's part. We're, we're reading the Holy Spirit's words right here as they were recorded 2,000 years ago. But what part does water play? What part does water play in a person being born again? Let's allow the Bible to interpret itself. John chapter 3 and verse 5, you must be born of water and the Spirit. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16, Jesus said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel, the good news, to every preacher. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. So when a person hears this gospel message, this good news, they believe it. They're baptized. That word means to be immersed in water. They'll be saved or born again. They'll enter into the kingdom of God. The Bible is interpreting itself. Acts 2 and verse 38, the day the church began, Peter said to them, Repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, born of water and the Spirit, repenting of their sins. They believe in Christ. They repent of their sins. They're baptized, immersed in water. 
immersed in water in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and they'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is being born of water and the Spirit. You see, something special happens when a person is immersed, when a person is baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. In Acts 22 and verse 16, Ananias told Saul, who would become Paul the Apostle later on, Now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Calling on the name is being born again. And you arise and you're baptized to have your sins washed away. But we must understand it's not the water that does the washing and baptism. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5 says of Christians, He has washed us from our sins in His own blood. And that cleansing takes place in water. In the water of baptism. When a person does that, their sins are washed away, not by the water, but by the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, Paul speaks about the significance of baptism, how it is a burial in water. It's not sprinkling, it's not pouring, it's a burial in water. In him, Paul says, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh. By the circumcision of Christ. How did that happen? Buried with him in baptism. In which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Where is our faith? It's in the working of God. Not in the water. Not in the person baptizing you. The faith is in the working of God that he will perform a circumcision made without hands the putting off of the sins of the flesh, the forgiveness of sins, the washing away of sins. So the person may be raised up through faith in the working of God. By God who raised him from the dead. That's very similar to Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Raised to walk in newness of life. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. John the apostle says, There are three that bear witness on earth. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. These three agree as one. Some translations say they are in agreement. The ones that bear witness on earth, that a person is a child of God, the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit. We read about, we know about the Holy Spirit. We know His message because He's given us this book. And He is the one who gave us the good news, the gospel. The water is baptism. That's baptism in which we benefit by the blood. The blood of Jesus Christ that was shed. And so the Holy Spirit, water baptism, and the blood of Jesus Christ, all of these three agree in one and they make a person a child of God. And then something else happens. It happens in baptism along with being born again, along with the forgiveness of sins, along with a person having their sins washed away, having been brought up to walk in newness of life. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13, For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body. You read Ephesians, you find out that the body there is referring to the church. All baptized into one church whether Jews or Greeks, or whether slaves or free, having been made to drink into one spirit. So when a person obeys the gospel, not only are they saved from their sins, remember what Jesus said in John 3, verse 5, 3 and 5, you enter into the kingdom of God. And so when a person is baptized, they're baptized into one church, into one body. And when a person obeys the gospel, they are born again into the kingdom of God, which is the church of Christ. Acts 2 and verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. Added to the church of Christ, not a denomination. None of them, none of them existed in the first century and in Acts chapter 2. And they shouldn't exist today. 
there should be only one body. And when people believe and obey this gospel, trusting in the death, trusting in the blood, trusting in this good news, they'll be cleansed. They'll be purified. They'll be born again. They'll be placed or added to the kingdom of God, which is the church of Christ. Are you a Christian this morning? <clears throat> Have you been truly born again according to the biblical plan of salvation? We urge you to consider these things. If you wish to study this further, if this intrigues you, if you wish to know how you can be a Christian, nothing more, nothing less, just a Christian according to the Bible, a member of the Lord's church, which is the kingdom of, kingdom of God, we'll study with you. If you wish to obey the gospel, we can baptize you into Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. This very morning. If you've done that, you've gone astray. We urge you to repent and come back to the Lord. As always, the choice is yours. While we stand, while we sing.